Good morning, St Luke's, and welcome to our daily Bible reading. And we're looking at Psalm 51 this morning, so as ever, uh, grab your Bibles and read that through before we think about it. Nobody likes to admit that they are wrong, do they? Uh, and nobody likes to admit that they have done wrong. However, that feeling of, of knowing that you are wrong, and particularly that you have committed uh, wrongdoing uh, against other, others, whether in thought or word or deed. Knowing that and not acknowledging it has an incredible dehumanising effect. There's that guilt that can hang over you. And so as a consequence, we hide more and more of ourselves from others in fear that they might suddenly realise what we have done or what we are truly like in our hearts uh, and on the inside. Alternatively, we increasingly harden our hearts in order to avoid the reality of our wrongdoing, or maybe to justify ourselves. In contrast to that, there is an incredible power uh, of release and freedom in acknowledging our guilt and receiving forgiveness. And it is very simple to ask. Uh, however, it's much more than just a simple saying sorry. Psalm 51 is one of the Bible's most prominent examples of the prayer of confession and forgiveness. The context for it is that King David is guilty. Uh, he is guilty of committing adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, he's then guilty of uh, a sort of uh, badly worked out attempt to cover it up. And then he is guilty of organising and arranging the death of Uriah. How does he respond when he is confronted by this guilt uh, by the prophet Nathan? Well, first he cries for mercy. Look at verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. So there's no attempt from King David to offer penance, to make up for what he's done, or indeed attempt to justify it. Previously, we've heard David vocal in his cries for vindication on account of his righteousness and his innocence. Here, those, here though, he knows he is guilty uh, and mercy is the only option for him. He cries out for mercy, trusting in the character of God to whom he cries. And that leads to the second point, that David acknowledges that his sin is against God. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. It's a really hard concept, this, for us to grasp, but principally, uh, when we commit any form of wrongdoing, when we sin, uh, that is against God primarily. It is God who sets the standards for humanity. It is God who is the moral absolute. It is the God who acts as judge uh, and the term determiner of justice. And so when we break his moral code and command, when we offend against his character, our offence is against him. Then uh, David acknowledges, though, that this particular offence that he has committed is part of a generalised pattern. It's a reflection of his very nature. Uh, so look at verse 10. Uh, sorry, look at verse 5, firstly. Sinful, I, uh, surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Like David, uh, our sinfulness and our offences are part of our natural human character. It is in our nature to defy God by our attitudes and our behaviours. It is therefore, in verse 10, you'll see, uh, create in me a pure heart, O God. It is our hearts that must be transformed. Uh, our offences are against God. They are part of our very nature and being. And so we must be transformed on the inside. Notice then the impact upon David of the guilt that he is feeling. Sin is crushing him in every way. It's not simply uh, a cerebral uh, acknowledgement in his head that he's done something that he shouldn't, uh, but it is causing him angst in every regard. It is there, sitting in verse 3, at the forefront of his mind in every way. My sin is always before me. Uh, we hear in verse 8 that it has almost a physical impact upon him, crushing his bones. 
Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. And so therefore, in receiving forgiveness, there is a wonderful emotional expression. Restore to me the joy of salvation. It doesn't affect just our head, but every part of our being when we know that we are guilty of sin. Uh, then fifthly, forgiveness is a testimony to God's glory. Verses 13 to 15. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Uh, my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. To know our forgiveness uh, is a cause of delight and public testimony to that forgiveness that we have been given. If we know it truly in our hearts, uh, we won't but be able to speak of it to others. And then lastly, uh, although confession and forgiveness do lead to transformed behaviour, it is ultimately a heart turned towards God that is his real delight. Verse 16, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it, says David. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings, but rather, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So this day, would you search your hearts? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal your sin to you and acknowledge it before God and then delight in your forgiveness? In our mind's eye, all this must be done, though, with our gaze fixed upon Jesus Christ and fixed upon his death upon the cross. For it is there that the absolutes of God's character combine. There his perfect moral code, his deep compassion and his love for humanity. There his righteous judgment and his action to bring forgiveness. Where we, meet, where, where we must cry for mercy, God acts to bring it upon us. So let it be this day, Lord, would you open our mouths that our lips would declare your praise as we look upon the cross of your son, Jesus Christ, and we see there the work of your act to deliver your mercy and forgiveness. Amen.